And we welcome you to SEIU Local 73 Communities Organized to Win, Aldermanic and Mayoral Candidate Forums. Communities Organized to Win was formed to help resolve problems that impact Chicago neighborhoods by taking a hands-on approach to community development. One of our models is we're all in this together, and we see ourselves as a connector between the community, the workplace, and our, selected our elected officials. A few of the connections we have worked with and are moving forward with are the Ban the Box campaign, keeping the Promise Ordinance, raising the minimum wage in Chicago, reopening community mental health clinics. In our near future, we are hoping to work on restructuring the property tax assessment system by increasing reinvestment in our schools, parks, libraries, and city streets, not decreasing it. Increasing accountability of businesses that benefit from our dollars, but don't contribute to our neighborhoods by closing corporate loopholes. Declare a moratorium on public school closings. Change the way TIF funds are allocated and bring them back to the blighted areas we live in as they were designed. Work to make the participatory budget model a required part of every ward's plan in the community, work to support job training and reinstituting high school trade professional and community college trade professional training with apprenticeships. We hope you will join us in our future challenges to better our communities. You are invited here to listen to the automatic candidates from the 6th, 9th, 21st, and 34th <coughs> wards in Chicago and the Chicago mayoral candidates. We hope this forum will inspire you to cast your ballot during early voting or on February 24th, 2015. Thank you, my name is Jennifer Edwards and I'm part of SEIU Local 73 Cal. I'd like to introduce our secretary treasurer, Mr. Matt Brandon. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Brother Hardiman. Uh, T.O. Hardiman is the executive director of, uh, for Violence Interrupters. And he has dedicated his life and career to community organizing for peace and social change. In 1999, Mr. Hardiman joined Ceasefire, an award-winning public health model that has been scientifically proven to reduce shootings and killings. In 2004, T.O. created the Violence Interrupter Initiative. In between all of that work, T.O. Hardiman took the time, his effort, and his energy to run in the Democratic primary for governor of the state of Illinois to show that he really intended to make change in the community. Today, the Violence Interrupters model has been replicated in 15 Chicago communities, seven cities in Illinois, 15 cities nationwide, England, Iraq, and South Africa. In addition, more than 30 cities and 20 nations concerned about their own levels of shootings and killings have expressed interest in learning more about violence interrupters. Mr. Hardman is a frequent media contributor on the issues of Chicago violence and gang conflict. He has appeared on the local affiliate of every major television network for numerous national public radio stories and has been covered by the New York Times Magazine, the Chicago Tribune, the Chicago Red Eye, Jet Magazine, the Chicago Sun-Times, and numerous other publications. The Interrupters documentary, based on T.O.'s work, has won film festival awards across the nation. The Violence Interrupters also intervene in dogfighting in the city of Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator, Mr. T.O. Hardiman. How's everybody doing today? We okay? All right, we'll get right down to business here, and uh, I'm grateful to be here. And uh, first and foremost, we want to welcome everybody to the, to the uh, event today. And let me get to my page where I have to do my introduction. Just bear with me. <laughs> All right. On behalf of Cal, we would like to thank the following participating community groups for your past and future contributions with Cal, and invite anyone not mentioned to connect with Cal as we move forward for the betterment of our neighborhoods. Uh, educational Village Keepers, Resident, Ma Resident Matters, Reunite Chat Chatham, 
uh, stop that's uh, Southside Together Organizers for Power, the Mental Health Movement, Chicago Housing Initiative, Coalition of Black Trade Unions, and the Anti-Eviction anti Coalition, Park Manor Neighbors Community Council, Chesterfield Community Council, Southeast Side Initiatives, West Chesterfield Community Association, Michigan Indiana Block Club Association, Kenwood Oakland Community Organization, and others. Today's candidates for the 9th Ward, the 34th Ward, the 6th Ward, and the mayoral candidates forum, that's what we'll uh, cover today, and the 21st Ward. Uh, please give your written questions to the student pages that are collecting cards throughout the audience. Um, and the audience questions will be alternated with community prepared questions as time permits. Now these are the candidate guidelines. This is very important. Timekeepers will be seated on the stage, on stage with the candidates as the moderator will also assist with, uh, with the timekeeping. Candidates seating will be at random upon arrival. Each candidate will be given two minutes for opening and one minute, 30 seconds for, to answer each question. Each candidate will be given an opportunity to answer the questions first. The first question will be in the prescribed order. All subsequent questions will be directed to the next candidate on the right or left, depending on the stage seating. Um, if time permits, there will be a two-minute closing for each candidate. We thank you for attending our candidates for forum. We hope you will have gained additional information that will assist your voting selection. We invite you to also stop at the tables located at the entrance for candidates and community literature. So does that sound okay? So we good, are we ready? Yes. Are we ready? So we're gonna start, uh, first of all, let me introduce our panelists over here to the left of me. We have Reverend Jack K. Lewis, right? Did I pronounce that right? All right, good. And Dr. Carmen Palmer and uh, Sharon Pinter, you got it? So let's get these panelists a hand for being here with us today. All right, is that Frederick Collins right there? Yes, That's Fred yes. Now, Mr. Frederick Collins is in the, in the audience as well, and Frederick Collins, he was going to run for mayor of Chicago, but let's get his brother a hand as well. All right. So now what we'll do, uh, we'll get down to business, and uh, we have with us today, hold on for one second, bear with me. We're going to deal with the Ninth Ward today, but we only have two candidates on the stage with us right now, and to my immediate right, we have um, Michael, Lef Michael E. Lafargue. Perfect. Right? Yes. And we have Mr. Uh, Theodore Williams. So. Okay. Okay, the timekeepers are right in front of me. That's good. Okay. So with that, we're going to start out by, allow by allowing um, uh, Michael E. Farg, La Lafarg, Lafarg. Lafarg to give a, a two-minute introduction. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Okay. We thank uh, the communities organized to win to, for organizing this event and Simeon High School for hosting this event. I am Michael Lafarg. My parents raised me in this community. I worked, went to school, and came back to this community after I was married, so I care. My father was an African-American businessman in this community, and he had a business at the north end of the community at uh, 87th and State Street. I'm a community leader. I'm particularly qualified to be a leader as a alderman. I earned my master's degree in public administration and business administration from IIT University. I'm professionally uh, skilled. I've been employed by Fortune 500 corporations as IBM Corporation. I've been in the public sector as, as worked for CTA and RTA, and I've been self-employed as a realtor and worked for a developer which built Stony Island Plaza. Public service has always been important to me. I'm a, as a young man, I was a member of the Auburn Gresham Lions Club. I'm currently the president of the West Chesterfield Community Association. I have been asked to run uh, by residents of Greater Roseland. I have been sponsored by the Ninth Ward Automatic Search Community Council as their People's Choice candidate. After 16 years, this alderman has, we need change. Roseland is reported as the most eighth most deadly community out of Chicago, 77. 70% of the schools are on probation. The alderman has a 97% voting record with the uh, mayor. The incumbent did not oppose the 2012 and 2013 school closing. So I am for everything that the SEIU supports, and this is why, as president of the West Chesterfield Community Association, they donated $1,000 to our organization because of our trans, uh, transparency and accountability, and because we are for what the SEIU Local 73 stands for. You heard it read earlier. I am Michael Lafargue, Punch 53, vote for me. 
All right, thank you. Right on time. That was good. All right. So now we will uh, turn our attention to uh, Mr. Theodore Ted Williams, running for Knife Ward Alderman. Dr. Martin Luther King said that everyone can be great because everyone can serve. I am here because I want to serve my community. Currently, I am a professor of political science at Kennedy King College. I am the chairman of the social sciences department there at the college, and I've been teaching for 12 years. I'm a graduate of Rutgers University in New Jersey and a graduate of the University of Chicago with my graduate degree in public policy studies. I grew up between Chicago and South Bend, Indiana. I first lived in Inglewood. We moved progressively east to I ended up in South Bend, Indiana, where my father moved our family there to pursue a opportunity as a car dealer uh, in South Bend, Indiana. I'm a firm believer that service is the greatest use of our time, our energy, our talent, and our opportunities. In the Ninth Ward, we have a, a myriad of problems. We have a 21% unemployment rate in many places in the ward. Uh, we have over 70% of our schools on probation. We have one of the most violent communities in the city of Chicago. I'm a member of the Far South Community Action Council where we've worked on education issues. I'm a member of the Pullman Community Development Corporation. We've worked on a variety of uh, development issues. Uh, I also am a member of Developing Communities Project. I have been endorsed by the IFT, AFT Local 1600 where I am the legislative chair at the Kennedy King College campus. I helped to negotiate the first union contract for part-time city workers, city college adjunct professors in the city college's history. I also am supported by uh, other unions uh, and other folks in our community who desire change. I decided to run for office because people in the community asked me to run for office. This is a great honor. I'd like to share with you today our plans for the community. I believe it is time for a change. Our current alderman has, I, in many ways, uh, really uh, disappointed many people. And I am here today to ask okay. you for your support and your vote. Thank you very much. All right, let's give him a hand. It's time to, okay, yes. Okay. And as we move forward to the questions from the panelists, just remember each candidate has one minute, 30 seconds to respond, okay? And I have to make sure we're on time, so don't all take right. nothing personal. I have a habit of cutting people off when I need to, all right? That's why I'm the moderator today. All right, so here we go. So we'll turn it over. Yes. Okay. All right, here we go. I'll read a couple of questions from the audience first, and then we'll get to the panelists, okay? Here we go, question number one to both candidates. What do you feel about incumbent candidates that don't participate with these type of forums? That's a good question, audience member, good question. So let's start with our mic. Well, it's simply disrespectful. This is a very important decision for each of us to make. This is about change. We have an incumbent that's been in office for 16 years, and he's got 3,000 jobs for the community, but that equates to 187,087 jobs out of 16 years. He is not here to defend himself, but let me share with you. The Roseland Business Development Council has endorsed my candidacy because he has turned their back on them. He has neglected these, uh, this uh, business organization. The incumbent, I am very surprised that he is not here. I think that is simply disrespectful. This is a very important decision. We're talking about developing this ward from the internal out, the red line extension going to Alkill Gardens is important. We have crime, as a, okay. my uh, colleague mentioned, it can be solved through economic development, jobs, business development, and we have plans for that through our panels of development at each rail station, 103rd, 115th, uh, business, Roseland Business Development um, District for the medical area and 130th Street. We have some exciting plans for all guild gardens as uh, we can develop businesses around the water reclamation plant. We have excellent plans. 95th Street should be a preferred point of destination. Our vision, imagine if you will, a safe, secure community with vibrant with jobs, economic development, and as, uh, schools where a child can walk across the street and go to a good school and get a great education. The Ninth Ward can be a great place to live and to raise a family. Okay, thanks for your response. 
All right, next candidate, uh, same question. What do you feel about incumbent candidates that don't participate in these type of forums? The term democracy means government of the people. I suggest that we ought to have a level of insult as the people for any candidates who are in office who are not willing to come and defend their records before the people. <clears throat> this is not our government. It is not our system. These are not our seats. They are your seats. It is your system. It is your government. Unfortunately, in our community, the reason why we get such bad representation is because we don't hold our government leaders accountable. I am on record as supporting the work of the Office of the Legislative uh, Inspector General at the City Council level. I have been on record as supporting term limits for City Council members. At the end of the day, transparency and authenticity are extremely important in the political process. And if I am elected, I will pledge my life and my support to making sure that we are accountable and that the people own this seat and none of us own the seat. All right, thanks so much, appreciate that. So we have one more question from the audience as well, okay? So are, are we not important enough to hear from them? That's a serious question because everybody's vote counts. And when people need your vote, they try to talk to you sometimes, but are we not important enough to hear from them? You know, it forms, it's similar like the same question, but are, are the people important, bottom line? I am here to represent the Ninth Ward from North, South, East, and West. I will be bringing a collaborative approach to government. I am for participatory budgeting as it relates to uh, the automatic menu money. I am for protecting your pensions, the city pensions. We should be funding our pension system. I'm for looking for alternative ways to finance our cities, possibly the LaSalle tax and other areas. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an alderman after 16 years he has turned his bot back on the community. He has sold out to big business. It only took our president, Obama, six years to turn our country around. 16 years of filth and trash on Michigan Avenue, prostitution along Michigan Avenue. He has turned his back vacant lots. At our last debate, the alderman stated that he does not want to sell lots for a dollar. That's okay. how you get tax property on tax rolls, ladies and gentlemen, and finance our schools. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate that. Okay, same question. Well, can you repeat the question? I, it's okay. similar to the last one. Yeah, I'm similar, assuming. Is but, there a uh, difference? Yes, yeah, a little difference there. Are we not important enough to hear from them? Because well, see, what happens is, let me say this here. A lot of times, once a person wins the particular office, you don't hear from them anymore. So that's what the question is mainly all about. Well, I think there's a very obvious answer to that. <laughs> and uh, I don't necessarily need to re repeat. But what I will say is that when you look at our city, uh, literally at the municipal election, the last election, less than 25% of people came out to vote. Uh, we have to hold our public officials accountable. The reason I'm running for office right now is because they need to be challenged. Uh, when you look at the conditions facing our community, we ought to have 50 people running for aldermen because the time is now for change. There's a sense of urgency that we have to make our communities what they can be. And so, once again, I think it's very important for anyone that wants your vote to come and express their views and their ideas to you. Um, I, as well, am a person that is about a team approach. I also support a resident-based advisory board for the use of TIF dollars in our community because at the end of the day, once again, we ought to have control as the people on the decisions that are made in our ward. Okay, thank you very much. Let's get him a hand for those two questions. All right. Okay. All right, with that being said, now we'll turn it over to the panelists and we can begin with our first question from the, from the panelists. My first question is, from, is for economic justice. From the privatization of infrastructure, such as the Skyway to parking meters, to public service from custodial, management and professional services. Municipal governments have attempted to save taxpayers money by outsourcing the provisions of publicly financed services. This strategy has a track record of failure. Critics argue that the only savings derived from cutting corners on quality and pushing workers into poverty. Do you support publicly operated and publicly financed public services? 
And as alderman, would you support the privatization, transparency, and accountability ordinance to create a fair process to decide whether to outsource these services? That is a very good question. <clears throat> I'm against privatization, particularly as it affects union jobs and city employees. Privatization has become the new patronage of the city. Privatization, tell me, how has the toll road privatization worked for you? How has the parking lot meter privatization worked for you? How has the red light camera privatization worked for you? Are you aware that most of those revenues from the red light cameras go to the red light camera systems? Are you aware that those systems have been scandalized with um, been scandalized with bribery. The uh, yellow lights have been uh, shaved down. We have the shortest uh, yellow lights in, this, uh, in the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, I stood with the Veteran Business Government Association as they announced their transparency and accountability rules regarding privatization, and I stood with the progressive aldermen on this issue. I am against privatization especially as it becomes a patronage situation. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Same question. You got it? Yes, I do support the ordinance. Uh, I only support privatized efforts, privatization efforts, if they are effective, if they are efficient, and if they are responsive to minority communities. Currently, right now, the contracts that do go out in the Ninth Ward, only 40% of those go to minorities in the area. If you understand this, uh, privatization has been negative in many ways, but if it is going to be used in any industry, it must be used to make sure that local businesses have an opportunity to bid for those contracts. And minorities and people within the Ninth Ward get the majority of those contracts. In that way, I would support it, but in most of the ways where we have privatization right now, I would not. Okay, good, thanks, good answer. Okay, so what we're going to do now, I have another question from the audience, then we'll just alternate back to the panelists. All right, so this is a real good question here. What is your position on red light and speed cameras? And we'll start with Michael LaFarge. All right, well, thank you. That's another very good question. We touched upon that earlier. The red light cameras need to be abolished. I will be your alderman to work to abolish the red light cameras. There's a number of problems. There's been a 15% decrease in T-bone accidents. However, there's been a 22% increase in rear end accidents, accidents. That is a 7% net increase. Ladies and gentlemen, the system has been plagued with bribery. The first uh, system, corporation, Red Flex Transportation Systems, bribed a city official 100,000. The second one shaved seconds off of the red light, uh, off of the yellow light. 16,000 people got tickets. We need to be refund those monies. It is understood that the uh, cameras have been disproportionately placed in minority communities. This is a horrible system. But more importantly, the system affects, negatively affects our constitution, state and local, the state and US constitution. It basically states it does not give you your due process. You are guilty before you go to a court of law. Abolish the red light cameras. Gotcha. All right. Okay. All right. Same question. This is a very easy issue, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in America, you are innocent until proven guilty. With red light cameras, you are guilty until you prove yourself innocent. Uh, we have to change the way that this system works. There's $500 million of revenue that has been gained by the red light camera. We have the largest red light camera program in the entire nation, and we have the shortest yellow light times. To me, it, it, this is a very black and white issue. The red light cameras have to go. We have to make sure as well uh, that the public safety issue that, that was just mentioned, uh, that we address it. But we don't address it through red light cameras. In fact, red light cameras are having the opposite effect. Uh, I signed the pledge for the citizens against red light cameras. Uh, I will continue to work with them. Uh, for me, on a personal level, I have unfortunately uh, been guilty of some of the red light camera violations at times. And I know that it is a, um, um, an overwhelming burden financially for communities that can ill afford the financial burden. And there is no public safety record on these cameras. In fact, really, let's call a spade a spade. These are about making money, and because of that, they have to go. 
Thanks a lot. Let's give both of the gentlemen a hand for that again. You know, th there was 15 seconds left, Ted. Are you aware that the alderman voted for red light cameras? <laughs> then he went to WVON and said, hey, I'm for abolishing the red light cameras. Then, just last week, he is now in city council saying, no, let's keep the red light cameras, but let's massage things a little bit. Okay. Something to remember when you go to the polls. All right. <laughs> That's right. So Thank we'll you. take the next question from the... Uh, the next panel is here. Appreciate it. All right. Well, um, there is a growing number of residents in the Ninth Ward and across the city that feel, one, it is not the schools failing our children. It's the Chicago Board of Education failing our schools. And two, it's not too few children in our schools. It's too few programs and services in our schools to meet the needs of our children. We therefore feel that Chicago needs a school board elected by the people, not appointed by the mayor. How would you work with your constituents to contribute to the effort of getting an elected school board for our Chicago public schools? Okay. All right, um, another very good question. I am for having an elected school board. We are the only city in the state of Illinois that does not have an elected school board. Ladies and gentlemen, this, uh, Chicago Public Schools have failed us. You should be able to walk across the street down the block and go to a good school. You should be able to go to a chemistry lab in the school and have chemicals to use for your chemistry class. There should be biology specimens in those classrooms, but there aren't. There should be books in the library. We have one school, Harlan High School, on probation for 18 years. I am for an elected school board. I am for stronger LSEs and LSEs working with one another throughout the city of Chicago for best practices. I am. Uh, I am a member of the Far South Side Community Action Council, as Ted is, I'm a newer member, and we must, as a community, work on these problems. Areas that you're passionate on, we will have automatic advisory committees. This has been a part of my platform since I announced on July 19th. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. Okay, same question. I, too, support an elected school board for all the reasons that I mentioned before, that this is a democracy and the people ought to have an impact and a say-so in how their schools are governed. The question also asks about arts programming. 42% of CPS schools do not have a full-time arts program or arts instructor. Uh, this is something that I have lived and I have done. I have helped to create arts programs in schools. I have worked on a STEM grant at the city colleges level that, that actually put forth STEM programs for high school students within the city. I worked uh, with the Chicago Arts Partnership for Education on an arts integrated education program that taught kids reading and writing through the arts. Uh, I have worked as an arts entrepreneur. And so what I understand is, is that our kids need programming. Uh, I've worked as a union negotiator. I understand the issues around education intimately. And for me, education is our number one priority. If we don't educate our kids, oftentimes those we fail to educate, we end up having to incarcerate. And we've got to change that dynamic. So we've got to pour resources into education if we want to change public safety, if we want to change the conditions and the tenor of our community. Education is a priority. And to me, that starts with an elected school board. And Ted, there's five seconds left. Are you aware that the alderman is so not in favor of an elected school board? Okay, let's get them both a hand for answering the questions. And then I'm gonna um, say to the candidates, um, use your time wisely, okay? Because I can't let you just keep jumping in after he talks, okay? Absolutely. All right, just wanna make that clear. All right, so right now I'm gonna ask another question from the audience, then we'll get to the next panelist question, okay? So this is a question here that impacts everybody. Should employers, should employers be required to offer paid leave in the event of illness, domestic violence, or an emergency school closing? And we'll start off with uh, Ted over there. I'm trying to get all those situations written. You said illness, domestic violence, and school closings, correct? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, I would say on this issue, I would fully support uh, an effort to, for this kind of pay, paid leave. I think we have to be wise about how we spend money at the city level. But for me, this makes a great deal of sense. Uh, when people have paid leaves, it shows, their studies show that they are more productive at work. We understand as well that if you look at the United States compared to other places in the world, for instance, Europe, they have a shorter work day, they work less time, they're healthier, they live longer, and we've gotta create an environment in our country where workers are supported, where they are believed in, and they have the 
economic support to make sure that they can take care of all of their other obligations. I do support paid leave. I do support that it within all those three scenarios. And I think it's a very important part of how we move forward in our communities to make our, our families specifically, which are critical, to make them healthier. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Same question. I concur with my colleague here. <clears throat> we need to appreciate the employees of our great city. I do support paid leave, and as I've traveled Europe and studied their systems, yes, they do have shorter week, work weeks. They can use that one extra day to take care of family business, or they can adjust their schedules. It's very important. I am an alderman that would support paid leave, but we must be fiscally responsible as we do this. Thank you. Oh, good, good answer. Let's give him another hand. We're going to keep it motivated, keep it moving. Good, uh, good answers. So with that, we'll go to the next panelist uh, question here. Hold on. Just hold on one second. Yeah. We have such wonderful questions from the Ninth Ward. Um, so we're going to go over a little bit since we're not ready for our next ward, if that's OK with everybody. OK. And our candidates here are just so wonderful, too, so we want to. <laughs> All right, thank you. OK, gentlemen, my question um, is under the area of housing. In 2014, the Chicago Housing Initiative proposed the Keeping the Promise Ordinance. This ordinance, which will decrease the homeless population, provides oversight of the Chicago Housing Authority and advance the city's affordable housing plan. This ordinance will not cost the city a single dollar. How would you support this ordinance to provide the much needed oversight of the CHA? Uh, I fully support the Keeping the Promise Ordinance. I understand that the Keeping the Promise Ordinance is based on the idea that CHA is working with a $432 million surplus. There are literally thousands of vouchers that are not given out each year that if they were given out could reduce the homelessness rate, rate in our city by 12%. I have worked with the Chicago Housing Authority. In New Jersey, I worked with the New Brunswick Housing Authority. I worked to train residents when they were moving from public housing into the Section 8 program for six years. My business had a contract with them. So I'm very familiar with public housing. I've actually worked in Alt Gale Gardens as well and the issues surrounding public housing. It is critical that we make sure that people have an opportunity for high quality housing in the city. It's very critical. And so if we've got money that's just sitting there, we have to move those dollars immediately. And the Keeping the Promise Ordinance would do that. And because of that, I give it my full support. I also support the Keeping the Promise Ordinance. As my colleague mentioned, $432 million. That is a significant amount of money. That could provide housing for 12,000 people. But not only that, it could provide an opportunity for jobs and economic development in renovating homes for these people to live in. It, it is a very important uh, ordinance. I will be your affordable housing alderman. But affordable housing works very well in a community that is on a, an up scale in, um, in development, OK? So let me share with you. I will be your affordable housing <laughs> alderman. I saw the time and it, <laughs> it stopped my train of comfort. Uh, no, you okay. You yes, I have th 20 seconds. Right. Uh, we can also <laughs> use TIF money to renovate these homes, OK, and uh, help people with jobs and economic development. So I do support the Keeping the Promise Ordinance. Thank you so much. All right, good. OK. All right. Another good question from the audience there. OK, we'll start with Ted again. Does the Walmart development benefit residents of the Ninth Ward? You don't want to ask me about Walmart. <laughs> I've been talking about Walmart all morning. Right. Uh, let me say this. In communities that are stable economically, if you notice when Walmart comes, they typically protest Walmart. In communities that are struggling economically, we have the false idea that Walmart is an economic panacea, and it is not. If you understand what Walmart does, for instance, in our ward, we had $11 million in a TIF fund that was supposed to go to the Roseland, Michigan corridor. Well, it was given to the Walmart project. Those are the kinds of things, to me, that tear apart our community. 
Do you realize that 68 cents on every dollar that is earned by a local entrepreneur is reinvested back into the community? One of the reasons why the Ninth Ward is so economically deprived and, and just uh, basically destroyed is because we don't own the businesses in our community. So Walmart, you know, I like Walmart like everybody else. I'm an American, right? And I want to get my cheap DVDs or whatever. But what I understand is, is that when you're talking about long-term development in a community, Walmart is not a panacea. And what Walmart has done in this community is it's never brought one single neighborhood out of poverty. And it will not start with the Ninth Ward. What you must understand is those jobs are low-wage jobs. And many people who are taking those jobs are still on uh, federal and economic benefits. We've got to have a better plan for our community than Walmart. Walmart has not rescued anyone, and it will not rescue us. Thank right. you. Good answer. Okay, same question. Yes, small business. It, economists, economists state that small businesses are the cornerstone of our communities. Small businesses are what makes a community. Walmart has been proven to be a bloodsucker, to take away from our small businesses. We have built a Walmart on the far east side of the expressway, but there's no transportation for people to get to that Walmart. 40% of the people that work for Walmart work part-time. Another 20% to 20% work for t on a temporary basis. They have to reapply for their job every 180 days. They have an economic plan that is not to our benefit. Ladies and gentlemen, we must. Well, are you aware that all the money that is, uh, goes to Walmart goes immediately out of our community? $3.5 billion come into the greater Roseland community and leave out almost immediately. We need to build our small business system, our small business infrastructure that we already have there. 30 seconds, thank you so much. We, <laughs> Walmart received $11 million in TIF money to develop the groundwork, but they also received $22 million in tax incentives and another $7 million in federal grants. Oh my gosh, this is Walmart, the world's largest corporation. There's got to be a limit to incentives. We need to develop our community from within. The red line extension, business development around those corridors okay. and businesses, jobs for our people reflective of us. All right, Thank sounds you. good. Got you. Well, uh, that says a lot for Walmarts, right? <laughs> All right, so here we go. We go to the next question from the panelists here. All right. According to the Chicago Reader, your constituents have been plagued with an unemployment rate higher than any larger metropolitan area. While the Chicago black unemployment rate is 25%, with Caucasians being 7% and Latinos 12%, that number does not include the blacks who have been unemployed for over a year. In order for the black community to thrive, the black unemployment rate must closely reflect that of the city. Would you write legislation to develop black economic empowerment and a jobs bill that will more evenly balance the unemployment playing field and reduce black unemployment in the city of Chicago? I'll start off with Ted, and then we get to Michael. I will. But here's what I will also do. I will pledge to create a business incubator in the Ninth Ward. It is critical for us to identify sources of capital for small businesses. You must understand that a small business owned by an African-American entrepreneur is much more likely to hire another African-American from the community. This is not rocket science. So when we look at this, and we've looked at poverty even in places around the world, I teach my students about microcredit programs happening all throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. And what they're realizing is, is that if you're trying to build economically from the outside without building from the inside, you have a failed plan. So we have got to, if we're going to deal with unemployment long term, we have to support our small businesses. I support identifying capital sources through this business incubator. I support training young people and giving them uh, incentives to create their own businesses. Our kids are brilliant, and they are talented, and they ought to not be looking for a job, but they ought to be looking to create jobs. And so as we talk about unemployment, if we don't deal with that issue, then we have a significant problem. Our unemployment uh, levels are depression level 
unemployment levels. To me, ladies and gentlemen, this is unacceptable, and it deserves our full urgency immediately, not next week, but immediately. And small businesses and medium-sized businesses, my father is a franchise owner of McDonald's, has been a car dealer, I've worked with him for years. I understand how small businesses work and what they're looking for to come into a community. I've started a small business as well as an arts entrepreneur. We need entrepreneurship. Thank you. All right, good. Same question. All right. Could you repeat the beginning of the question, please? Thank you. Would you write legislation to develop black economic empowerment and a jobs bill that will build more evenly balance the employment playing field and reduce the black unemployment rate in the city of Chicago? Okay. My answer is absolutely yes. I would write legislation in that uh, area. Uh, jobs. Martin Luther King said if 30% of a city's population consists of the Negro, then doesn't it make sense that 30% of those jobs would go to the Negro? And it would not just be the menial jobs. We must have economic parity in our business, we must, in our community. We must have black on black business, um, minority on minority businesses to, to grow our community. We would do what I have been doing as a member of the Developing uh, Communities Project, as a member of the uh, Ed Gardner Initiative for Workforce Development. We are accepting business plans right now for businesses around the Red Line Extension. We are, uh, have been approached by a major motor motorcycle corporation that wants to build a certified tr uh, training facility in the ward. We have been approached by a technology uh, corporation that wants to build uh, tr train people for not only jobs, but for careers. We have been approached by a gentleman in Virginia that is interested in building shopping centers in our community. Um, my answer is yes, I will write legislation for job parity. It is very important. It is very important. I will be your jobs and economic development alderman. Thank you. All right, good answer, good answer. Okay. Can we have another uh, question from the audience here. As Alderman, we'll start out with Michael this time. As Alderman, what will you do to reduce the, the violence on our streets and community? Our streets are filthy. Please address this issue, so the violence and cleaning our streets up overall. Okay. <clears throat> um, we do have a, a major crime problem, and even though the incumbent was on, in charge of the, the chairman of the police committee and fire uh, committee at the city council, I have been endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police, and there's a number of reasons for that. This is because I support increasing our police depart department by 1,500 officers and bringing foot patrols back to, to the community. But this must be implemented with a strategy of the police department embracing our community and bringing our trusting relationship between the businesses and the police, the, our residents and the police, and our young youth and the police. I, jobs and economic development is a mind changer, okay? So again, the emphasis of building our community from the inside out, our Michigan Avenue business strip infrastructure, 103rd Street, 95th Street should be a preferred point of destination for everyone. I hope and I believe I answered your question. Uh, we have so much great potential, so many great people. Again, we mentioned all Gale Gardens and their interests and needs in working with the Water Reclamation uh, Department. Jobs and economic development will reduce crime. Nobody wants to be a prostitute on Michigan Avenue as we have prostitutes now. No one wants to be breaking into your home on a regular basis to get put food in the mouth. Jobs and economic development. I have worked for a developer. I know what I'm talking about. Okay, thanks again. Thanks. All right. We're doing, we're doing pretty good. And, uh, everybody in the audience needs to know this number here. The Chicago Urban League released some numbers that there's a 92% unemployment rate amongst African American youth between the ages of 16 and 19 in the state of Illinois right now. 88% of the African American youth live right here in Chicago. That's right. All right. So we'll take the next question from our uh, panelists. I have to answer the question. No, we'll get to you next. Oh, yes, yes. Um, candidates. Many members of the Ninth Ward community. Oh, yeah, hold on. I'm sorry. Hold up. You know, we started with Michael, my fault, and uh, mm -hmm. we got to get to Ted for that. That's okay. That I got question. something to say about violence, too. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. The antidote to violence is hope. The reason why our young people commit crimes is because they live in situations where they are hopeless. 
In order to fix violence in our community, we have to have a holistic solution that addresses this issue. Number one, I've talked about this entrepreneurship, this business incubator, this arts development, this programmatic uh, focus, the STEM programs for young people so that they can have alternatives to committing crimes. Secondly, what we know about violence is that in our communities, there's a small percentage of people that are committing most of the crimes. I just talk, had a meeting with a probation officer just this week who talked about how literally if we could change our criminal justice approach and we focus and target our policing efforts on monitoring and helping young people who are caught up in the system, then we can reduce crime drastically in our communities. He talked to me about how at one point 10 years ago, most of his cases were about kids with drugs. Now they're about kids with guns and we can target and we can support and we can promote and we can change this. Number three, community policing efforts work. People must feel respected by the police and so if we have a relationship with the police, it has been proven to bring crime down. Number four, gun buyback programs are effective. Since 2000, half of all of the guns seized in Chicago have come from out of state. We gotta recognize this. We have to understand it. And so if we focus on those three or four efforts, or five, whatever I just said, uh, it is a holistic effort. All and right. if we do that, we can change the violence in our community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good answer, good answer. All right. All right, so we'll take the next question from the panelists. Yes. Uh, many members of the Ninth Ward community were able to move into the middle class through union-supported careers, such as teachers, postmen, policemen, and firemen. We believe that unions continue to play a critical role in our society. The current struggles of unions should be a concern for everyone, especially our government officials. As the new alderman of the Ninth Ward, how would you ensure your support of unions and collective bargaining to keep the present and younger generations within an economic status that supports middle class opportunities. Okay, we set up to Michael, then we get to Ted, then we'll reverse it after that. All right, <coughs> unions are extremely important to our community. From the beginning, with the brotherhood of the sleeping uh, car porters, unions are the core of our middle class. We, I fully support unions. Again, this is why the SEIU has provided uh, me through the uh, West Chesterfield Community Association support. I am, from day one, since my announcement, have mentioned that I am in favor of unions, protecting them, the collective bargaining, uh, bargaining system, because unions protect you, the residents of the Ninth Ward. They keep our income levels at a higher rate. Unions are extremely important because you cannot always defend yourself. We always need someone to help us. It is those that have the least, when you do the least for your brothers and sisters, that is when you've done for God. The unions help us. I respect them and I want to maintain that collective bargaining system where our current incumbent did not support the Chicago Teachers Union at all in their teacher's strike, in the closing of schools, this affects our businesses. The businesses along Michigan Avenue uh, Strip said, when the schools closed, they lost their afternoon business. This affects them. It affects our economy. We need money to pour into our community, and this is why we need to retain our unions to keep that money within our community. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Okay. Ted, yep. When Dr. King died, he was in Memphis organizing sanitation workers to make sure that they had benefits and they could um, fulfill their work obligations with the protection of unions. I understand that unions are extremely important and they are a path to the middle class. For this reason, I have spent my career, my academic career, as a member of a union, as a union negotiator with the IEA-NEA, uh, as the legislative chair for the IFT, AFT, Cook County College Teachers, Local 1600, we are right now uh, endorsed by the Iron Workers Union, Local 33, and we are actually pursuing other union engagements and relationships because I understand the significance of unions. And unions, if you look at our community, there is a disproportionate of our workers from the African American community that are not necessarily taking the benefits of a lot of the unions in the state. I think we ought to change this. 
I think we ought to push for union engagement. I think we ought to protect our workers' rights. And I think if we do that, we begin to help to recreate some of the economic mobility that happened 20, 30 years ago with unions. And for that reason, I think that it is important that we continue to support them. Thank you. Very good. All right. So I just want to um, inform the audience as well, if we plan to go into 2.30 with this particular uh, panel here, okay, with all of uh, the candidates for the ninth ward, because the 34th ward candidates have not shown up just yet. And also we started a little late, okay? And then I just want to add this too, when uh, the 2,200 or more CPS staff were fired, th those people represented 2,200 families, so you multiply that number by five. That represented a whole lot of people that lost their jobs, probably lost their homes, uh, they ended up on unemployment and everything else, so I appreciate those answers. Okay, here we go. This is another question from the audience here. And we'll start with Ted this time. I love this question. If elected, will you pledge to the people of the Ninth War that you will not become a rubber stamp alderman, but will you work uh, solely for the interests of the people? I love it. I'll start with Ted. In politics, there are no permanent friends, nor permanent enemies. There are only permanent interests. Every community must have political independence. One of the things that I'm actually excited about in the city council election is that we are literally essentially independent candidates, all of us. Why would I give that up? Our current alderman has voted 95% of the time with the mayor. I don't agree with anybody 95% of the time. My wife is here, but honey, I agree with you wherever you are, okay? That's right, okay? Make sure that's really clear here. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it is important for us to be independent politically. African Americans, we suffer when we are not because the political party system, one party takes us for granted, the other one just takes us. We've got to recognize that our power is our strength and we are independent. So as an alderman, I pledge to you, I promise you, if you elect me, you can come to my office and hold me accountable. I will not be a rubber stamp for the mayor. I will be politically independent. I will support the people, not the agenda of the establishment. It is critical for us, and that's how we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Michael. Well, there's been a standard. What, what makes a, a rubber stamp alderman? A rubber stamp alderman is someone that votes 89% of the time with uh, the mayor. Oh, he's not here. <laughs> this is a rubber stamp alderman. He has voted 97% of the time with the previous mayor and the current mayor when you average them out. It is important that we remain our independent as, and it is very important that we represent the constituents of the ward. This is why many of you will receive a precinct survey when you walk out of here so that we can understand your, your interests and your needs and your direction. What, where do you want us to go? We represent you. Um, again, we know the voting record of the alderman. It is absolutely amazing that he voted against siphoning off uh, money that should have gone to the public schools when TIF could have been reformed years ago. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will not be a rubber stamp alderman. I am here to represent you. W.E. Du Bois said, the world does not belong to the meek. If you think it does, you have not made your presence known. I paraphrased a little bit, but that is my heart. I will not be a rubber stamp alderman. I will re be representing you as the ninth ward alderman. Okay, gotcha. okay, I'm gonna make sure. So we'll take Thank another you. question uh, from the panelists here. Okay, my uh, question is in the area of health. Uh, how do you feel about the closure of so many much needed community mental health clinics and how would you resolve the lack of resources for mentally challenged individuals? I can hear the last part of the question. Yeah, could you speak up a how bit? would you resolve the lack of resources for mentally challenged individuals? Cool. All right, fantastic. Uh, so I did uh, work on this issue. I pledged my support to uh, the organization in the city that is working around mental health issues. Um, I m grew up in a home with a mother who was a therapist. Uh, and so I was always getting therapy, uh, even when I didn't want to when I was growing up in my home. Because of that, I understand the great need and the great uh, power of mental health services. 
Uh, there are a lot of ways. We have a lot of financial problems. And I don't want to uh, brush over that in this conversation. Uh, our city pension crisis is drastic. We're underfunded in 50% of our pensions, and that basically ends up being about $7,000 worth of debt for each city resident. So there is no sort of magic bullet when it comes to money. But having said that, we can't balance the budget on the backs of the mentally ill. We can't balance the budget on the backs of the poor. So what I'm suggesting is, is that we have to be creative in terms of finding new sources of revenue, but we have to do it in a way that protects vital mental health services because they are greatly needed in our communities. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, indeed. All right. Mental health is a very important situation. Yes, we must look at alternative ways to finance our government. We talked about the possibility of financial taxes. There's the possibility of looking at commuter taxes, renaming, uh, charging corporations for renaming public buildings except for City Hall. If there's a referendum for a casino and the city wants that, let's have a casino. Let's bring Midway Airport back so that people fly from Saudi Arabia to come to a world-class casino, if this is what the city wants. Statistics show that mental health in America is, uh, adult blacks are 20% more likely to report a serious psychological distress problem. Adult blacks living below the property line are two to three times more likely to report psychological distress we have 61% living per below the poverty level in many parts of our ward. Adult blacks are more likely to have feelings of sadness, hopelessness, and worthlessness because of their economic situation. Jobs and economic development can assist us. I am for uh, increasing our mental health facilities. We must uh, raise money to do this. Again, it is when you do it for the least of your brothers and sisters, that is when you are doing for our king. Ladies and gentlemen, we need our mental health facilities. I'm one that will be doing, I'll be the alderman that does for us, for our community. I will be representing you on this issue. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. So um, I was just informed as well that uh, Mr. Um, Theodore Williams, you may have to leave in about five or 10 minutes, right? So we will not carry this on to 2.30, so we're gonna start speeding it up just a little bit here. So another question from the audience. Uh, do you, and we'll start with uh, Michael this time. Do you support a participatory budget approach? Please uh, outline how you would organize that particular initiative. Absolutely. At my campaign office, we brought in staff from uh, various groups to discuss participatory budgeting. Again, I bring a collaborative approach to our community. There will be community councils and where to advise the alderman on the areas that you're passionate in, budgeting, schools, parks, education. Participatory budgeting is a way to bring the community together to decide how you want to invest money in your community. This is infrastructure money, the $1.3 million that the alderman receives. I am for participatory budgeting and a collaborative approach to our government. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. All right. Chad? Yeah, I support it as well. I support a resident-based advisory council for the use of TIF dollars. Uh, I support the work of the legislative inspector general at the city level. These are all areas that our current aldermen are not supporting. Uh, for me, we need more transparency. I also support uh, an elected school board. All of these, if you think about all these issues together, they are truly about people having uh, a say-so in their governance. At the end of the day, this is not anyone's seat up here, it is the people's seat. And for that reason, I support participatory budgeting and I support a variety of other measures to make sure that we have access to the decision-making process. Good, all right. <clears throat> Good. So we'll just take two more questions, one more from the panelists and then one more from the audience, okay? So we can go with the next question. Tiff, which is tax increment financing, has diverted taxpayer funds for public services like schools, parks, and public safety to private sector economic development, both in the city center to a lesser extent to promote economic development in blighted neighborhoods. What do you think of TIF, or tax increment financing, and how would you fund both economic development and essential public services. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, 
I do believe in the use of providing an incentive to bring a business to a community. However, TIFs were originally organized to work in blighted communities. This is what Mayor Washington wanted. It has been sabotaged. Between 2004 and 2008, $2.5 billion in TIF money went to the downtown area. That's not a blighted area. It frustrates me, ladies and gentlemen. And only 500,000, possibly a million, came to the Ninth Ward. This is not fair. It's not appropriate. That TIF money could be used for homes, affordable housing, business development. Ladies and gentlemen, we must reform our tax incremental financing. It is needed but it needs to be changed. Also, the current alderman voted against re uh, the ordinance for using TIF money to get money back into our public schools. Are you aware that once a TIF district is uh, organized, there's a baseline, and for 23 years, none of that money from that baseline, even if the values increase, goes to the city services, public schools, et cetera. It stays at the slow level. It's not fair. Let's refinance tax incremental financing and let's bring it to the ninth ward appropriately. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Williams. Uh, TIFs are a great tool. Uh, TIFs are very important. But unfortunately, we all realize that our TIF dollars are not being used in the city in an equitable and an accountable fashion. $55 million in the TIF fund is going right now to the DePaul Marriott Stadium project. This is unacceptable. So for me, it's not an issue of whether TIFs work or not. I think they do work, but they have to be put in the areas that are most significant. As we've both talked about here, we've had TIF dollars in our community. We've had a 24-year TIF off of the Roseland, Michigan corridor, but those TIF dollars were moved into a project for the world's largest retailer. And what I'm suggesting is, is that people ought to have accountability on the use of TIF dollars. As I said to you before, I support the residents being involved in that process. And when we do that, then we make sure that our TIF dollars go for what they are supposed to go for, and that is developing and promoting and restoring and renewing economically blighted communities. Okay, good, good. All right. So we'll take one last question from the audience, and after this question, you guys will have about a minute to uh, wrap up, you know, for us here, about a minute, 30 seconds, right? Okay, here we go. What is your stand on energy efficient housing and automobiles? Would you as Alderman take a stand on building our community up with the various energy usage systems? Uh, please specify, and we'll start out with uh, Mr. Theodore Ted Williams. Sure, so I do support energy efficient housing and automobiles. When my wife and I moved to the ward, uh, my wife being uh, an engineer, uh, she literally made me go out and recycle the stuff in our house. Unfortunately, in our community, people felt for years that we don't need to recycle things. So we would literally take our garbage and drive it uh, t 10 minutes to, to a place where we could recycle because we wanted to make sure that we were basically taking care of the earth and taking care of our community. So we live this. This is very important to me, and it's very important to our communities. Um, I support uh, a variety of energy efficient usage from light bulbs. I support uh, even the creation and the working of uh, uh, electric cars that have been pushed. I pr uh, support tax incentives for those kinds of programs. We've got to look at not just short-term development, but long-term development. And the environment is very important. Let me say this very quickly. 71% of African Americans live in communities that are in violation of the federal um, of the federal EPA's uh, air quality standards. So we're suffering heavily. We have the highest rates in our ward of asthma in the city, and we have the highest rates of breast cancer in our area. What we must understand is that environmental pollution is significant. Our current alderman has ex voted to expand and, and work with the Land O'Lakes landfill that's polluting the far southeast end of the city, of the, of the ward. I live in that area. It's unconscionable to me. So the environment is extremely important. Environmental justice is important. And if we do it in a way that is energy efficient, we can have long-term development. But at the end of the day, we've got to stop polluting our communities because we're dying at unbelievable numbers because of it. Okay, good. Yes. Right. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I thoroughly believe in protecting our environment. This is why 
I am a member of the Southeast Environmental Task Force. We went to City Hall and protested on the mayor's floor against pet coke. This is why I'm a member of the Environmental Equities Matters of the University of Illinois Voorhees Center. We surveyed the Ninth Ward, the Greater Roseland community, and we've identified brownfields and other areas of concern. The Ninth Ward is one of the most heavily polluted wards in the city. Air particulates, land particulates, brownfields, water. Ladies and gentlemen, we need change. I come from an environmental background. I believe in using photovoltaic windows. Those are solar powered windows to provide energy to use to uh, uh, properties. I do believe in solar panels. I do believe in uh, thermal uh, 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 thermal heat. Ladies and gentlemen, there are ways you can uh, position a building where a concrete wall in the building can absorb light and heat and radiate heat throughout the entire night for a resident. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, we do need to protect our environment. I will be your uh, alderman, and we are working on, we have a prior, prioritized list of projects that we are working, uh, attacking in the Ninth Ward. For example, we are looking at uh, the 107th uh, 7th Street Brownfield area. We want to revitalize that community, re-image that area. I will be your environmental alderman. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all right. So um, at this time, we'll make sure each candidate gives a closing statement. And I want to make sure that I mention your entire name and make sure you all mention your punch number as well. And we'll start out with Mr. Theodore Ted Williams. This is your closing statement, about a minute and 30 seconds. There's a historic phrase, Dr. King's well, that describes the fierce urgency of now. Unfortunately, our communities suffer because we don't expect better. And we vote for the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Einstein said that's the definition of insanity. But if you are in the Ninth Ward and you're a resident of the Ninth Ward, if you are happy with the conditions of the community, then do not vote for anyone on the stage. Vote for the current alderman. But if you believe that we can have a better community, if you believe that we, our kids, deserve better, if you believe that crime does not have to be in our community, unemployment does not have to be in our community, that economic opportunity can be in our community, and we don't have to go downtown to go and have entertainment options, if you believe that, then join me in this mission. This is not about me. This is about service. It is about a mission. It is about changing our community. I have lived in the Ninth Ward for close to 10 years. My wife and I bought our first home there. But before that, I lived on the north side, and then I lived in Indiana, and then I lived in New Jersey, and then I lived in southern Indiana, and I've lived all over the world, all over, all over the country, excuse me. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that I've seen what a community can look like. My kids live in the Ninth Ward. We're raising our family here because we believe it can be better. I have seen better. I will work for better. Join me. If you want the Ninth Ward to thrive, punch 55. Thank you very much. <laughs> So we'll get right to uh, Mr. Um, Michael E. Lafargue. All right. Running for alderman in the ninth ward. Yes, I am Michael Lafargue. I will be your next ninth ward alderman. All right. W. E. Du Bois said, "Do you thoroughly believe that the meek shall inherit the earth?" I say not. Father Flager says not. I'm sure Reverend Al Sampson says not. Dr. Martin Luther King said not. Crime is a problem in our community. It is jobs, economic development, and education that is going to resolve that, a holistic approach. If you want narcotics on your streets, don't vote for me. If you want low property or values, don't vote for me. If you don't want the red line extension of economic development around each station, do not vote for me. But if you want change, vote for me. If you want that red line economic development, a vibrant community, a, a, a Michigan Avenue that might be called Magnificent Mile South, a little bit of soul to it, <laughs> vote for me. It is time to make change, repeal Alderman Bill, vote 53, vote for Michael Lafarge. Thank you. All right. So um, let's, let's give our panelists a hand, too, for participating. And, uh, and uh, before the uh, candidates leave, I just like a lot of energy. Let's give it up once again for Mr. Theodore Ted Williams and Michael E. Lafarge. Let's give it up for them. Right. Right. Thank you. 